This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Fiona Doyle, and I am the Dean of the Graduate Division. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the second lecture of the Harvest Distinguished Women Lecture Series. Um, for those who don't know, the Graduate Division has a proud tradition of managing the Berkeley Graduate Lectures. We now have eight lectureships, each with a distinct endowment history. These unique lectureship programs have brought distinguished visitors to Berkeley since, believe it or not, 1904, so this is long-standing tradition, um, to speak on a wide range of topics, ranging from philosophy to sciences, with an awful lot in between. We've hosted dignitaries, Nobel laureates, and many hundreds of globally renowned thinkers whose, whose ideas have a um, world-changing influence. The Harvest Lectures are the newest addition to this stellar collection, and I'm convinced that they will have a similar impact to some of the others. Um, the Harvest Distinguished Women Lecture Series features women from a broad range of disciplines and cultures. It offers a forum to foster thoughtful dialogue and an opportunity to be inspired by outstanding and accomplished women leaders. Um, today's lecturer, as you will um, hear, um, certainly fits this mold. Professor Laura Tyson is remarkable for her accomplishments um, and impact, not just in academia, but also in public service. The inaugural, inaugural lecture in the Harvest series was presented by Harriet Fulbright in October of 2013, and like our event today, was convened here at International House. This is the perfect setting for dialogue centered on shaping a world of greater understanding and where diversity of perspective is welcome. But also, International House is a place where individuals are encouraged to dream big and see that they can truly change the world. The Harvest name originates from combining the first names of our lecture benefactors, UC Berkeley alumni couple Harvey Lee of 88 and Esther Ma, 87, um, both of Hong Kong. I'm delighted to say that Esther and Harvey are here today with us, um, along with several of their family members. Um, so if you get a chance, do give them a warm welcome back to Berkeley. Um, It's now my pleasure to invite Esther to the lectern for a few minutes to talk about her vision in establishing this lecture series, and then I'll come and introduce the lecturer. Um, Esther. Welcome. Thank you, Dean Doyle. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, students and faculty. Well, a uh, happy belated Valentine's Day and a happy pre-Chinese New Year of the Ram. Gong hei fa tai. So this is how the harvest story goes. In 1985, on a sunny day by the Sather Gate, two Berkeley freshmen from Hong Kong met by fate. Harvey and Esther, or when the names combined, better known as Harvest, were passionate about studying economics. Harvey took Econ 1 from Professor Laura Tyson, while Esther got Professor Freeman. And before you knew it, the Harvest seed was sown and started to blossom in Wheeler Hall. 
So today, 30 years later, Harvest returns to Cal with their little harvest, Kishantika, to celebrate the 1985 vintage, but more importantly, to pay tribute to their alma mater. So Javi and I are really honored to be here today to host the second series of the Harvest Distinguished Women Leader Lecture Series. We are very honored that our guest speaker is Professor Laura Tyson, who actually was Harvey's first economics professor, and she was the one who inspired Harvey to major in economics, who in turn inspired me to follow suit. There's a saying that women hold up half the sky. Well, being a full-time mom and being a full-time owner of my own public relations company, I must say that most of the time I have to hold up more than half of the company and more than half of the family. And, um, you know, men are normally considered as the breadwinners of the family, while women are the pillars of the family, having to take care of so many household chores, kids' education, financial planning, logistics management, signing checks, and entertaining guests. So how do we do it all, right? It really takes someone with good time management and multitasking skills. And I must say, women are actually quite fortunate to be born with the talent of good time management and prioritization, especially for super achievers like Professor Tyson, who also writes books, who also does research, who also um, gives you know, speeches like today, and who also advises the President of the United States. She indeed is a role model. Speaking of role model, over the years that I've been involved with a lot of women-related business organizations and charity organizations, I've been telling all my 25 mentees that it's very important to find a good role model or a mentor for life. Someone who can share with you their experiences and their insights. Someone who can inspire women to empower themselves. And I think it's very important that these days, we as women have to empower ourselves and then have to nurture our leadership skills to give back to the community. And this is indeed the inspiration behind our endowment of Harvest Distinguished Women Leader Lecture Series. And as Dean Doyle mentioned earlier, the series was launched back in October of 2013, and we were very honored to have Mrs. Harriet Fulbright as our inaugural speaker, who delivered an enlightening speech on international education. And I think, you know, through prominent speakers sharing, we hope that this lecture series will be able to elevate the status of women from a socioeconomic, professional, and personal aspect. Just to let women to live up to my favorite four P's framework, which is P for passion. I think it's very important for someone, for yourself, to find your passion, to really find what you love doing, and then to live your dreams to the fullest. The second P is for positivity. This word I use a lot to teach my kids, Keisha and Tika. I said, always think positive. Don't think negative. Always think of a glass being half full and not half empty. Because positivity breeds happiness, it breeds self-confidence, it breeds success. And the third P is for perseverance. Don't let anyone come in the way, anything come in the way to achieve your goal. It's all about willpower all about discipline. Um, and I always, you know, my favorite case study is to share my own experience in overcoming three miscarriages within four years. Uh, but, you know, I thought, I told myself, at least I'm conceivable. At least I know one day I'm going to be a mother. So now I have two beautiful daughters. And the fourth P for philanthropy. Philanthropy meaning giving back to the community, giving back to your alma mater, because there are so many unfortunate and underprivileged people out there who need our help. So Javi and I are really excited today that we're going to learn about the fifth P, politics. <laughs> How politics or policy making will empower women in the workplace and in the family and in turn add value to the economy. Let us welcome Professor Laura Tyson. 
our honorable guest speaker, who will be speaking on women's work in the world economy from a political and personal perspective. Thank you. How did you want to go up? I'll just sit here. That was great. Fantastic. The four Ps, I'll remember. I'll remember the four Ps. You, you and Harvey are truly inspirational um, in your vision for um, endow endowing this lecture series. Um, without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Professor Laura Tyson. Um, you have biographical notes, and um, Laura said, please don't spend too long introducing me, um, other than, <laughs> she says, um, Basically, I've been here a very long time. <laughs> um, Professor Tyson joined the Berkeley faculty in 1977. She's been on the faculty um, at the House School of Business since 1990, and she was the dean of the um, School of Business um, from 1998 to 2001. In addition, um, as Esther mentions, she has advised pres presidents of the United States. Um, she's the former chair of the US President's Council of Economic Advisor and former director of the National Economic Council under the Clinton administration. She was the first woman to hold both of these roles. And more recently, um, she served on President Barack Obama's Economic Recovery Advisory Board, so we can thank Laura for the improving global um, economy. Um, Without further ado, um, I'm going to welcome um, to the stage my colleague and ask you to do similarly. I appreciate that. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's really, uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, the University of California, Berkeley has been uh, a major part of my life for a very long time. It's actually very inspiring to actually meet students who I once taught many years ago. I, I was asked uh, when I was in Washington the first time uh, with President Clinton, I had a knack for making economics fairly simple. So people would say to me constantly, where did you get the training to make economics fairly simple? And I said, well, a lecture hall of 800 freshmen and sophomores who you had to keep awake and keep engaged. And that was my best training. So the university has been extremely important to me. And I'm very, very thankful to welcome Esther and Harvey back and to realize that I'm connected uh, to them in that very personally important way. I'm going to talk about women's work in the world economy tonight. I will focus on the policy aspects, but also focus on the economic argument. And, and I want to start this by saying that I myself have not spent most of my life studying women in the global economy. I got to this issue personally, and I got fascinated by it. Maybe I developed a little passion for it uh, relatively recently. The first thing I had passion for as a student was economics. And when I studied economics, I went to Smith College. And I did not realize, because I was at an all-women's school, that economics was a male discipline. So I liked economics. Uh, most of my professors were actually, at that point, male professors. But I thought the discipline was fantastic. Um, and I tend, therefore, to think about problems that interest me are economic problems. I went to MIT, and at MIT I studied international economic development and comparative political economy. How do societies organize themselves to be competitive, to be prosperous, to promote uh, rapid growth in uh, output per person, be product, to have great productivity? What, what do societies do? So one of the things that I discovered increasingly was that um, how societies treat women, their gender, what I'm going to call all night gender parity, the extent to which men and women are treated equally in a variety of areas, that gender parity actually does have an effect on an economy's economic performance. And it's an effect which actually in the past 20 years 
has really been demonstrated in study after study. So whereas we might have thought that before, we might have just had an intuition that was true, we have a very dramatic amount of evidence now coming from economists, coming from psychologists, coming from political scientists, coming from countries all over the world, that countries that have greater degrees of gender parity also have a superior economic performance in a variety of ways. So I'm going to talk about that tonight. Um, I got first interested in this question because I was, as I said, I was always interested in economics, always interested in how societies perform comparatively, competitively. Uh, but I was a dean of two business schools also. Uh, the business school here, right across the street, a great business school, fantastic. Uh, London Business School, also a wonderful business school. One is more international in makeup than the other, but they're actually at the top of their game. And what I discovered, and I should have known this, but I discovered it, was that business schools were one of the few higher education areas where women were not yet at the 50% or parity level in terms of enrollment. Women weren't going to business school to the same extent as men were. If they went to business school, they were not staying in business school. If they graduated from business school, they were not staying in business. So this is like, I noticed this. And I tried to begin to understand, since I was a female dean of two business schools, what business schools might do to encourage more women. In the process of thinking about that, there were others around the world thinking about how to, they were looking at this business case for women, the economic case for women, the economic case for gender parity. I was approached by something called the World Economic Forum. So the World Economic Forum is a nonprofit. It's uh, very influential. It grew out of actually an academic institution uh, in Switzerland 45 years ago. Uh, it has become uh, very influential around the world, brings together great leaders from around the world, both business and political leaders, to talk about pressing economic issues and to think about what are the factors that lead to uh, an economy's success. So the World Economic Forum approached me while I was thinking about why aren't there more women in business schools and said, we want to put together uh, a, a rigorous analysis of how countries are doing on gender parity in a number of dimensions. And then we want to see how a country's performance on gender parity affects its economic performance. That was their uh, mission. And they asked if I would be interested in doing this. And I said, absolutely, because I had been thinking about it. Uh, so we got um, some very good. Um, help at the forum. We got a couple of uh, really good data economists. I'm more of, a, of an economist who sort of uh, does case studies and country studies, so we've got some very good rigorous data economists. And we put together a report which has come to be called the Global Gender Gap Report. Now, before I start with the numbers, um, I want to tell just a personal anecdote about my first engagement with the World Economic Forum, because it predated when they came to me in 2003 and 2004 and said, will you work on this issue? I had gone to the World Economic Forum as a member of the US government uh, working for Bill Clinton. And my spouse had come along. Um, and uh, this was the mid-1990s. So at that point, there were very few men who were spouses at the World Economic Forum. <laughs> there were a whole bunch of women who were spouses at the World Economic Forum and very few men. So we arrived, my husband and I, um, and he was offered a flowered bag <laughs> and I was offered a black briefcase. <laughs> he was offered a sleigh ride through town and I was offered a panel to discuss global economic activity. Back in the mid-1990s, spouses uh, were not invited to go to the major sessions of the World Economic Forum. By the way, there's at least one person in the audience who knows my husband pretty well, and she can guess he was not pleased. <laughs> 
In fact, he has refused ever to go back to the World Economic Forum with me, even though I tell him on a regular basis, look, no sleigh rides, no flowered bags. You can go to whatever event you want to. It's all right, dear. No, no, he's not coming. Um, so this is just a, an anecdote about changing style because now the World Economic Forum, although it itself has not reached gender parity, absolutely not, so 20% of its participants are women, but what I will say is you have some of the major women leaders around the world there. You have the major female CEOs there. You have whole panels talking about what companies can do to promote greater gender parity, what countries can do to promote greater gender parity. So it's gone from a non-issue to a absolutely central issue of the forum. And that's because what I'm going to show you now is some of the results. What the evidence shows very clearly is that countries that develop greater gender parity over time in a variety of measures actually do end up having superior economic performance, and we can talk about why. So let me just tell you a little bit about this, uh, what the, the gender gap is trying to measure. Now, I'm going to say you can go to the World Economic Forum website. The report's there. It's, ne it's become the second most important report of the World Economic Forum all around the world, so people do at least look at it. It is a very good report, but it's pretty te tedious reading. You, you have to go in and sort of each country, you look at a whole bunch of measures. So I'm going to try to summarize for you what the results are. So we try to measure gender parity on a variety of dimensions that we thought were relevant to economic performance. Obviously, education is relevant to economic performance. So a country that, if you think about the workforce as being half female, you want to educate the workforce liter to, uh, in literacy, primary, secondary, tertiary, all the way through, you want to uh, basically achieve gender parity in educational opportunity and educational attainment. So that was obviously an obvious one. Health and survival, obvious. I, I, uh, a country's performance on uh, the health and survival of men and women and whether there are any gender issues there is important. Uh, economic participation and opportunity. So this is really, we look at lots of things here. We look at what economists call labor force participation rates, to what extent is the female working, uh, the female population of working age working, labor force participation. But we don't just measure that, we measure pay gaps, gender gaps, female, male differences in earnings. And we measure opportunity gaps, which we kind of look at through attainment levels. And I'll, you'll see some of that later. And then political empowerment, uh, because uh, policies, about the economy, policies about education, policies about health are going to be affected by the gender parity or lack thereof in political representation. So these are the areas. We have 142 countries. We have uh, 14 variables. We weight them. We now have nine years of data. So you can sort of compare countries over time in terms of are they improving? Are they improving on one dimension but declining on another? So this is what we're attempting to, to study. And we believe that four of these, these four areas are the major ones for understanding a society's approach to gender parity. And we believe it's very important to, for economic performance. So that's the first thing. OK, this is a little graphic which kind of says um, how the world is doing. So each country gets measured. But we also do a weighted average of all countries to sort of say, how's the world on average doing in gender parity in education, gender parity in health, in economic opportunity, and political empowerment. And we use, very, we use a weighting measures. And what you can see right here is that actually, the world today has made a tremendous amount of progress in eliminating gender disparities in health and in education. It has eliminated, uh, not eliminated, it's reduced disparities in economic participation and opportunity, but there's a lot left to do. So you might read that as they, the world has eliminated 60% of the gap. 
Um, and then in political empowerment, uh, we have a long way to go. Around the world, there's a long way to go. Now, I want to say something about, I want to warn you about the, these numbers before I show some countries. Just because a country is doing pretty well in terms of parity doesn't mean that the level of education or health is that high. So we have a whole bunch of countries. Some are very developed, and they have a high degree of gender parity. That means they're getting high levels of education, high levels of health, and not much gender difference in those areas. You have some very poor countries who, had, who actually are doing pretty well in gender parity, but they're poor. They're poor. So their degree of tertiary education for both men and women might be low, or their degree of, uh, of, uh, of health outcomes might be low for both men and women. Uh, so I just want to make sure that one understands that to, uh, to have a, a country score, a country score of one on something means complete gender parity. Okay, um, very few countries get that on almost anything. So now we will go to next slide. Who's in the lead? Um, this is a graph which just shows averages. So those little lines are averages. Not to be, you would not be surprised that we, when you look at these countries, 142 countries, there's going to be a regional effect. So the highest average gender parity measures are in North America, the US and Canada. However, if you go down to Europe and Central Asia, Europe has actually, the, those ones way on the right there, they are basically the best performers in the lot. And I'm going to talk about them in a minute. There is a group of European countries who, on all dimensions, outperform everybody else. And uh, some of you can probably guess which ones those are. Uh, they're on the right. If you go down to the Middle East and North Africa, you'll see the average is the lowest. And you have some very uh, extreme outliers there. Um, this shows, and I'll get to a, a, a table or a slide later, when you think about reasons for gender disparities, uh, clearly one of them is going to be cultural. And uh, I think you see both a, a development level and a cultural level showing up in some of these regional differences. Uh, let me just, since countries like to see where they are, one of the fascinating things about if you ever create an index of everything, of, excuse me, if you create an index of anything by country, countries start to compete on it. So actually, this report has become widely read, in part because country leaders, business leaders in a country, NGOs in a country, uh, educational institutions, look at how the country's doing, and then they try to figure out what can they do to get better. So uh, this has the top uh, 20 over here. You'll see the United States is number 20. And then it has some of the other countries over there going to the bottom, uh, Yemen, 142, Pakistan, 141, Saudi Arabia, 130. Uh, and by the way, Saudi Arabia has improved its gender gap. Uh, it's reduced its gender gap in the last couple of years. Uh, it's moving in the right direction, but it's still, uh, as a ranking phenomenon, one of the least performing countries. So now let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about who's in the lead. Um, so you'll see those uh, top uh, five countries there. They're the Nordic countries. For some of you in this room, that would not be a surprise. You would predict that. That actually suggests a combination of culture and policy are very important here, that the policy is reflecting the culture. And so when you have things like compulsory paternity leave, not just maternity leave, but paternity leave, so you don't have any scapegoating of men and women, both parents have to take leave to take care of the children. When you have highly subsidized childcare that lasts a very long time, when you have uh, support for part-time workers at full-time salaries so that people have time to take care of their children for both men and women, those are reflections of a set of social norms which actually end up in policy that actually does have an effect on gender parity. If you go to the US for a minute, the US, uh, not, not a bad performer. Uh, this number says we've eliminated 75% of our aggregate gender gap. Where the US is weakest is politics. 
we do not do well here, okay? We're like, you know, we, we at, at the way we measure politics, uh, we've only eliminated 20% of the gap. I think we're number 60 out of 142 countries. We have a lot of room to go in politics in the United States. Uh, we measure politics here in parliamentary seats, ministerial positions, and head of state. Um, you might say, and I'll, this is just for those of you who think about how the challenges of doing something like this with data, an ideal thing would be to include mayors or city council. The problem is that you can't get numbers like that for the 142 countries. You can't get them for many countries at all. So if you're trying to do this comparatively, you have to choose data, statistics, measures that are common across countries. And that's how we end up with ministers, parliamentarians, and heads of state. If we manage to have a head of state as a woman in the next few years, uh, this would fundamentally change our position. But uh, that's, I'm, not, I'm not saying anything political. I'm, that's, a, that's a purely statistical observation, all right? That's purely statistical. Dynamics of the gender gap. So we've done this for nine years. Any progress? N not a whole lot. There's uh, stuff going on in pol First of all, this shows very clearly, again, that the biggest gaps around the world are in politics. Uh, the most reduced gaps are in education and health. And uh, the economic participation and opportunity is kind of in the middle there. We have made some progress around the world in political empowerment. The progress is pretty slow. You could barely see, you can see a little progress in the economic participation and opportunity line. Uh, the last time the report came out, my colleagues at the World Economic Forum used the rate of progress in economic participation and opportunity and concluded that if the world continues at the progress of the last nine years, it'll take 81 years to close the gender gap in economic participation and opportunity. So I think the world is going to do better than that. I don't think it's going to take 81 years, but that's, uh, that's what we found out. So now next. Okay, so now this is what the World Economic Forum, when they started to do this, uh, this is a question they were interested in answering. Remember, the World Economic Forum made its reputation by ranking countries on their competitiveness in the global economy. There's something called the Global Competitiveness Index. And that's how they made their reputation. When I was back there with my husband in flowered bags, that's the index they had. And they had a whole host of things they measured that they thought might be correlated with competitiveness, national competitiveness. Things like the, the rule of law, uh, open trading, um, uh, regulation, um, education. Gender, not there. Not there. Remember, it was the mid-1990s. Gender wasn't there. So the challenge for us was to say, would gender parity show up as something that we think it's related to global competitiveness, but does it show up? So this suggests that yes, there is a positive relationship, it's statistically significant, between how a country performs on its global gender gap index and its global competitiveness. So moving towards gender parity is associated with a more competitive outcome. And so that the whole reason for doing the study in the first place, once we had the numbers, we could say, mm, OK, that, that seems to be uh, uh, a relationship that makes sense. And then there's another one you can do, but it's, the same, it's a little bit the same thing. Global competitiveness is linked to global GDP per capita. So you can, and GDP per capita is the economist's favorite measure of global, of prosperity. So you measure a country's prosperity by GDP per capita. And this says, yes, there's a relationship between the global gender gap index and GDP per capita. So those were things that we had anticipated finding out and we did find them. So. Now, I'm going to, maybe I shouldn't put this one up yet because there's a lot more that I now want to say moving from the World Economic Forum itself to actually other work that's been done during this whole period on um, women, gender parity, and economic performance. So the World Economic Forum is one study 
one set of measures that looks at this relationship. I mentioned at the beginning there's been a lot of work going on on this. The International Monetary Fund is working on it. The World Bank has worked on it. Development economists have worked on it. And basically what they are working on is how does uh, greater gender parity affect economic performance and why? How does it affect it uh, and why? Now, to some extent, this is intuitive. It's absolutely intuitive. If half of the global labor force is women, and if women are becoming as educated as men, and we saw that in terms of the gender gaps in education really disappearing around the world, then clearly, if you believe that human talent has an effect on economic performance, then what you want to do is say that greater gender parity in economic opportunity and participation will mean greater mobilization of talent, and that will lead to superior economic performance. It's a very simple, um, intuitive relationship. And I think that's really what uh, a lot of the research uh, is now focused on. Now, if you think about it that way, how does one look at uh, measurements of uh, mobilizing gender talent? One simple way is what I mentioned before, labor force participation rates. Um, the International Monetary Fund is headed by uh, a very outstanding woman, Christine Lagarde, and when she goes around the world talking to countries and giving them advice about how to promote their future economic prosperity. This is one of the statistics she focuses on, just labor force participation rate um, how, and for women. And if you can get that labor force participation rate for women up to closer to that for men, uh, there will be faster uh, economic growth. So the OECD, for example, has estimated that um, if there was gender parity in labor force participation rates between men and women, in the developed economies, that would lead to an increase by about 12% of GDP per capita over a 20-year basis. That's, that's, a, that's a big number. You know, people sit around all around the world trying to figure out what to do to promote economic growth. That number is a big number. So if you can figure out a way to mobilize women into the workforce, that is going to be a big movement towards superior economic performance. But it's not just mobilizing women in the workforce. The other things you have to worry about are around the world, in the US, in, in every country to some extent, even in the, the Nordic countries, women tend to be overrepresented in relatively low productivity, part-time, low pay, with low advancement opportunity sectors of the economy. They're overrepresented there and they're underrepresented in high pay, high productivity, high opportunity sectors. So if you actually are interested in mobilizing female talent, it's not just getting them to participate in the workforce as much as men, but to have them have the opportunities uh, in these high productivity, high uh, performance, high pay, high opportunity careers. So looking at the, that suggests one looks at not just the labor force participation rates, but the wage gaps or the wage rates or the productivity differences. Um, and what you see there is just like all around the world, the labor force participation rates of women uh, tend to be lower than men. Um, there is a persistent wage gap. Now, the wage gap varies by country. Uh, it varies by sector, but you would still say that the, it's persistent, it's measurable, um, and it's significant. It's not a trivial number. And part of that gap, of course, is that um, women are caught more in these low productivity, low pay jobs. But even if you hold constant sector, even if you hold constant jobs, then you still see the wage gap. So for example, in the US, female earnings remain lower than men's for similar skill levels in nearly all occupations. That's in the US, including occupations that are predominantly held by men and occupations that are predominantly held by women. Even in occupations predominantly held by women, 
uh, there is a wage gap. And that's for women of some educational level. So that's important. Another thing that's important, certainly relevant to this audience, I would say, is the wage gap tends to start small for young women entering the labor force, certainly in developed countries. That would be true in the US. Small wage gap at the beginning. Gets bigger over time. Increases with childbirth. But here's a surprise. Is larger among top earners and those with high levels of educational attainment. Gets larger. And that, of course, is partly because of what has been co commonly called opting out, or motherhood, or um, taking care of family responsibilities. You know, there was just, and I, I urge you all to take a look at it, it's really remarkable. Um, my son just got married three weeks ago. Harvard Business School uh, does a big survey of its, uh, of male and female graduates over the past 40 years. So they have some graduates who are baby boomers like myself. They have some millennials who are you know, just 30 years old. They asked the men and the women what they expected in terms of did they think their career would be equally as important as their partners or less important. And did they think child care responsibilities would be equally shared or unequally shared? Women thought they were equally important and responsibilities would be equally shared. Men did not. <laughs> These are expectations of Harvard Business School graduates. All right, so this, this is now, this is today. This is right now. So you think about how the pressures on, when you, when you see these numbers, okay, that you start, the wage gap starts out not there and then develops over time, and it develops over time with children and people opting out and, and all of the responsibilities that Esther said you have to juggle, you, have to, you, you still have to juggle. And uh, societies that have make it easier, and that's the Nordic countries, tends to have, over time, better performance here because they're taking some of these family balancing issues and they are working to make them easier. So it's just an important point about um, the opting out pressures of family on women and the fact that, you know, the OECD says their estimate is the, penalty, the wage penalty, terrible thing to say, per child, 7% of your earnings, okay? This is, you know, this is among developed countries, so this is some of the, some of the issues. Um, now, I want to go from that, however, to make two important observations. Number one, the opting out phenomenon is real and costly, but it does not say in any way that women are less ambitious than men, so again, in developed countries, there are lots of surveys, including the Harvard survey that I just talked about. Aspirationally speaking, women want the same thing. They want the same thing on average. It's just harder for them to achieve. So this is not about aspiration and ambition. This is about how complicated it is to achieve that. Um, and the next thing is to say that it's hard to achieve it not just because many women are balancing work life. It's hard to achieve it because our workplaces aren't really organized very well to take, uh, to promote gender parity. And so for that, I'll use this pipeline number, okay? So, um, so this is, comes from McKinsey. And it's, there are two different uh, sort of surveys that lead to the same result here. One is a survey of pipeline of women in Fortune 500 companies. Another one is a set of surveys they did with their own participants. You can see here that in the US, and this would be true in the developed countries as well, in most of the developed countries as well, uh, women are at entry level professions doing, their companies are coming around to business schools around the world and they are absolutely intent on recruiting at parity, 50%, 50%. In this, in this survey, actually, the women were outperforming men a little bit. Um, but then you can see the fall off, the fall off to middle management, then the fall off to senior management, then the fall off to executive committee, then the fall off to 
top position. So by the time you get to the top position, I think the current number at the US, Fortune 500, is 5%, but we're not talking about a major difference. <laughs> so now we have a variety, we have a, a large number of experts around the world who are, tr who are doing a variety of techniques to figure out why this happens. Why does this happen? Some of this is opting out, but it's not all opting out. It's absolutely not. Um, there's a lot of evidence that uh, women are not given line opportunities to the same extent as men are, that they, don't, um, that they don't go in and negotiate for a line opportunity to the same extent that a man does, that the performance indicators that are used in the workplace are not, uh, not picking up women's performance as well as men. Uh, again, I'll just point out that there have been some really interesting articles. You can take a look at a series that Sheryl Sandberg is doing with Adam Grant, who's a very well-known organizational behavior uh, economist. Um, and they're in the New York Times, and they're doing a series. And one of the things you can see are things like, uh, on average, evaluations of men in workplace, evaluations of women in workplaces tend to be more critical. There was a killer article just a couple of weeks ago in something called The Upshot in the New York Times where they actually, I don't know if uh, you saw this, Fiona, but they actually looked at rankings of male and female professors by students around the country. And uh, both men and male and female students were much tougher on the women, much tougher on the women in terms of using words that were much more uh, sort of uh, the, the bossy word, the aggressive word, the insensitive word, not the leadership word, not the kind of talent word, not the. So there are all kinds of evaluation issues that I think are real. Um, and that shows up in the pipeline as well. Um, another pipeline measure for you is uh, Credit Suisse just did a really interesting study. And they said, we have another problem. Women get in the pipeline. But they get in the pipeline in terms of shared services, things where team spirit matters, things where it's a common service for everybody, like human resources or in investor relations. They get much less into the CFO. And then operations, no, that's not where they get the promotion opportunities. And then, of course, the operations tend to lead, oftentimes, to CEO positions, so they're not in that. So I think we have a whole lot of work to do in, the, in developed countries, in companies, in, and by, in policy to think about what we can do to improve the flow through in the pipeline. Because after all, if women are getting educated to this very high level uh, and we're losing them in the pipeline, and some of that can be improved by better workplace training, better workplace uh, evaluation of talent, then we should do that. That's better for the company. It's better for the individual. It's better for the country. So that's something that uh, I think has become a big focus of research now in uh, many, many business schools, including, including uh, in, at Haas. So um, companies, uh, there's growing evidence that the business case for promoting women is actually very strong. So what we have is. Uh, better, if a more diverse leadership of a company means the company better reflects the profiles of employees and customers. It has, there's a lot of evidence that more diverse teams lead to better decisions. So diversity in teams, both gender diversity and other kinds of diversity leads to better decisions. Um, companies that are ranked on indicators of organizational health, like how well do people get along, open communications, trust. More where there's greater diversity or greater parity uh, in leadership, those companies get ranked as having higher organizational health. And then what Credit Suisse has reported, and others have found the same thing, is companies that have more gender parity in their pipeline all the way through the top tend to have better financial performance. So let me, let me summarize where we are right now. There's a very strong country level economic case that moving towards greater gender parity, achieving gender equality in health, education, economic engagement, and political empowerment 
has beneficial effects on national economic performance. There is a very strong literature, uh, and it's uh, become uh, very compelling to read, that that is also true at the level of companies. And the biggest global companies in the world now recognize this and are trying to figure out how to uh, mobilize more female talent. Okay. So the country level data suggests it's going to take 81 years to get to parity. The, country, the company level data says, well, we're only at five, in, say, for the Fortune 500, we're only 5% of leadership. We're, we're really, we got a lot of space we need to fill up. What's going on? What are the barriers? What can we work on from a policy point of view or for a company point of view or from a university point of view? What can we work on to get this uh, moving faster to greater gender parity? Because we'll all be better off, okay? So um, this is just a, a, a table you can take to think about if you're interested in this. And I tried to put together some issues that were both at the level of the individual, things we can do at the level of the individual, things we need to address at the level of culture, things that companies or universities can do at the level of the workplace, uh, and what policymakers can do to try to get us to make progress faster. We still need to make progress. There are benefits to progress. We're not going fast enough. Okay. So I'm not going to go through all these because then we'd be here for five hours. I'm just going to pick out a couple of the ones that uh, I think are really interesting here. Educational choices. So um, this is the level of the student and what they choose to study. So this is an educational institution. Um, Walter Isaacson wrote that wonderful book about innovation. He has written a lot about the role of women in computers. In 1985, 37% of computer science undergraduate degrees were earned by women. In 2010, only 18% of computer science degrees were earned by women. And less than 1% of female college freshmen say they plan to major in computer science. Less than 1%. Now, the majority, the top 10 most remunerative careers are associated with certain college majors. One of those is computer science, okay? If you sort of look at the other nine of the top 10, they're in STEM, they're science, technology, education, and math. In all 10 of those highly remunerative majors, meaning majors that lead to highly remunerative positions, the majority of majors are men. Women are the majority of majors in the 10 least remunerative majors, 10 least ones. So this is partly a choice. And I think what people are working very hard on is where does this choice come from? Is this, does this have to do with the fact that for me, economics was not a male discipline. I was fine with economics. I didn't have to worry about all of the stereotyping or, or cultural biases against doing a, a male major because I was in a female school. There were no. Uh, males. So there's a whole set of things going on, really starting at preschool, fifth grade, eighth grade, college, trying to figure out how to make it, how to deal with this, this choice when we think that the choice may not be, uh, may be structured by some of the cultural norms like, um, like uh, stereotyping. So I would just leave that as one. Edu in individuals need to change their choices partly if we're going to make progress on this. Cultural look, I've already talked about work-life balance priorities, and, we've, and I think I will leave that. Uh, the spousal role and support comes directly from the Harvard Business School study I just mentioned. By the way, I have not raised with my son and daughter-in-law whether they ever had that discussion and what their expectations are, so I'm staying out of this. Um, workplace. I, I want to focus on this because um, companies are focusing on mentorship and training. Uh, they feel that, and I think Esther mentioned this, how important mentors are. And um, if you, is, part of that pipeline deterioration is that women don't have access to mentors because there are not that many women ahead of them who can be the mentor or the model. So they have to rely upon male mentors, and maybe male mentors are not as engaged with them. Or maybe they feel there's some distance 
So uh, mentorship and training is very important. Awareness and accountability. I want to talk about that because it came so much to the forefront uh, last fall. So last fall, um, the relatively new CEO of Microsoft was at an event uh, that was celebratory, celebratory of women in computer science. And he was asked a question about whether women should ask for raises. He said he thought women shouldn't ask for raises because that was bad karma. <laughs> he actually said that uh, if women didn't ask for raises, they, their talent would be recognized and they would get a raise. OK. That's a very meritocratic answer. But it turns out it flies in the face of a lot of evidence we have. We have a lot of evidence. And the evidence suggests two things. Number one, women on average, this is not true of all women, so all of these are averages, do not like to negotiate. Women describe negotiation as like going to the dentist. Men describe negotiation as like going to a ball game. They like it. So the evidence suggests that equally competent men and women will, the, the women are much less likely to ask for a raise, much less likely, because they don't feel good about that. Now, you ha if you are a CEO, you're a company, and you want to promote female talent, you have to know that. You have to know that, and you have to design your human resources policies to deal with that reality. That is the reality. Women are less confident than men, and they are less, on average, and they are less comfortable with negotiating for wages. So you have to know that to get awareness and accountability. You absolutely need to know that. So there's a whole list of research that deals with that. And then structure and policy. I've talked about this in terms of the, com the countries that are really moving um, the furthest here. The focus is on shared parental leave, childhood, child care assistance, tax policy, because you don't want to have a tax policy which, makes, which is differentiated in such a way that it discourages the second earner of the family to work. Um, you certainly need to have workplace equality laws. I mean, you need to have the basic institutions uh, that are in place. And then the last one, organizations designed for men in manufacturing, this gets to workplace flexibility. This gets to the issue of uh, most jobs today are not, do not require a physical presence all the time on a production line. And since flexibility turns out to be of critical importance to women, uh, particularly at certain times in their life, organizing the workplace around flexibility is going to become more and more important. So now I'm going to leave you with my most fun slide. But I want to say with this slide that this is the, reflects the work ongoing of a group of scholars around the country who are trying to look at relevant differences in gender behavior that are relevant to policymakers as they're thinking about what can we do to promote gender parity, or to business leaders who are thinking what can we do to promote gender parity. You need to know these kinds of differences if you're going to do the right thing. So these are some of the differences. Um, Men show up in study after study to be more confident. They, uh, in study after study, they turn up to be more, they like competition more. They, like, they are willing to negotiate more. Women worry about backlashes. They worry about stereotypes. They're a little worried about, when you see these results of the, how the students evaluated their professors, you're a little worried about stereotypes, OK? You're a little worried about being the bossy, unfeeling, a domineering woman, which, if you use the same words for men, would be the leader, insightful, inspiring uh, male. Um, so these are uh, uh, just a whole variety of differences. And I will lead you, I'll leave you again. We can talk about any one of these. But the good news here is that scholars around the country, and indeed around the world, using very sophisticated techniques now, are actually confirming, to my mind, some things of gender differences, which anecdotally I heard all my life, 
but actually now I can see that in experimental settings or in large survey settings with a lot of data and a lot of rigor, they're being documented. Um, so now let me, let me conclude here because I was asked to uh, make this a little bit um, personal with some personal observations about my own life. Um, I started with the fact that um, Berkeley was very important to me. Um, academic life is a kind of life which does allow you to ramp your time up and ramp your time down, to opt out a little bit, you know, when your child is really young, and then to opt back in with, with vigor a year later. So there are certain occupations which are naturally more flexible than others. And university professor for me, I mean, I always wanted to be a university professor, not because of that, but it turned out that that was really good. That was really a, a big plus. Um, but I do want to say that um, in thinking about my own life, first of all, my son uh, asked me a few years ago, he said, Mom, the women I'm dating want you to write a book because they want to know how you did it. And he, he said, and I don't know how you did it. I, he said, I was your son, but I have no idea. I, I, I didn't write the book. Maybe I should have at that point. But I do think that besides having a flexible job, which would be part of my answer, being an academic at a prestigious university, which was flexible with me, was a very important part of what I could do. So a workplace designed with flexibility in mind is going to be great. Um, but frankly, I also had a largely stay-at-home spouse. So if you read Sheryl Sandberg's book, Lean In, she has two lessons in her book. One is lean in, negotiate, uh, say you're, what, you're willing to take that job, don't let yourself be overlooked, all those things about negotiating, competition, those things are part of leaning in. She also says, marry the right person. <laughs> now, I want to say, I, I do think, I don't know how you manage to figure this all out. Is there like some big job interview that you do before? Anyway, she, spouses really do matter because of all the things we talked about earlier. Partnerships matter. I think Esther and Harvey's partnership really matters. You can see this. One of the things that's really interesting is if you look at Catalyst, Catalyst is a very good source of information on male gender differences in businesses. So 75% of men holding top business positions in the United States have spouses or partners who are not employed. 75%, OK? Not employed. 75% of women holding similar positions have spouses or partners who are employed full time. Balance, balance, balance. I had a spouse who was working from home. And so that made my life considerably easier. And I, you know, in thinking about what, I, what lessons I would have for people, the lessons are flexible career, flexible spouse, spouse who works at home. They're not generally applicable, I would say. Um, however, even in that setting, uh, the job I had that was most inflexible was working for Bill Clinton. Uh, any, working for any president, there's no flexibility in that. No flexibility. So that job was a job that I had, that my husband had, that my son had. It was our job. It was a family job. At the end of four years, the two other people who had the job besides me said, we're done with this job. We're going back to Berkeley. You're welcome to come with us. <laughs> now, I decided to come with them. I could have stayed. I, 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 I actually had the opportunity to get a cabinet level position. And I told the president I was going. But this is, this is about the nature of jobs, by the way, because I wasn't the only person who did that. Bob Reich, who's a professor at Cal and a good friend of mine, and my husband happens to be out to dinner with him tonight, Bob Reich and his family went through exactly the same discussion at exactly the same time. And Bob and I both left government. So there are certain careers and certain inflexibilities where you have to essentially say, this is the family. And families have to balance over the lifetime of a family how you deal with spousal um, issues of, of careers. Last night, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was uh, being interviewed. And she said, you know, uh, when I was younger, uh, my husband wanted to make it in this New York law firm in five years, in record time. She said, I did everything so he could do that. 
And she said, since then, he's been doing everything for me. <laughs> that was the balance they did in their life. So there are very important personal parts of this that, that you can't, a, a workplace can design a flexible job. But some jobs are not going to be flexible. And therefore, the flexibility is going to have to come in the family and the expectations of the family. Uh, so I think that leaning in is important for women. Leaning in is important for their spouses. Uh, leaning in is also important for companies. That is, companies have to say, what can I do to make uh, my workplace a more flexible, gender parity supporting workplace. Companies have to lean in. And of course, governments have to lean in. And this is where I hope the US is not at all a leader here, absolutely not a leader here, compared to other developed countries. I mean, just think about it this way. In France, you get, uh, I think, a month and a half off uh, from work before uh, your child is born, two and a half months after. And then you get full pay for working 80% time. That, that's how they've handled it. Different societies handle it, but they have very supportive family policies. And the US does not. And as a consequence of that, one of the things that's happened is our labor force participation rates are no longer leading the world. Um, and our wage gap numbers are no longer leading the world. That is, we're not, we're not showing. Uh, some people say that what's happened is we achieved a lot of increasing gender parity for a while. And then we kind of hit a wall, and we hit a wall around 2000. And since that time, labor force participation rates for women in the US have been coming down. And the wage gap uh, has stabilized. So women were making progress at closing the wage gap, but then it just stopped. So we need to think about, from a policy point of view, if we're committed to greater gender parity, what to do in the United States. So why don't I leave it? Policy, family, companies, there are great benefits to be had from promoting gender parity. There's lots to be done. When we do it, we have to understand that there are these underlying differences in how people behave, and we have to shape our institutions accordingly. Thank you. Thank you very much for a talk that was not only inspiring, but also wise. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I'd love to dominate the questions, but um, I know that there are lots of people in the audience who also have questions. Um, because we're taping um, this, one of the wonderful things that we do is record these lectures um, and post them so that um, people can uh, review them for posterity. Um, I'd ask anybody ask, um, who has questions to come up to the mic here um, so that um, their questions can be heard. So, um, yes, please start. Thank you. Laura, your um, points hit home on so many levels. I'm a headhunter. I do executive search for software startup companies in Silicon Valley. Um, I have for years been saying exactly what you said up there, that women won't negotiate, that women won't take chances, they're risk averse, risk -averse. they don't want to be entrepreneurs, they'd rather work for somebody else, they don't want that, they won't go out on a limb, they don't have the confidence. So what can I do when female after female, and it takes a long time to find a really qualified female executive, mm -hmm. turns me down for an offer because they don't want to trade off maybe a little bit of cash compensation for equity in the company, mm -hmm. or because they feel that they've reached a point of prominence in a large company and think to themselves, if I leave, I won't feel that stature that I, or status that I've attained. So look, I don't think, I, I think to some extent, particularly on these kinds of things, I think the most you can do is point out to individuals, whether they're male or female, that though they, they're making a choice, they should understand that that choice may reflect uh, a broader set of um, cultural norms that they've absorbed without even realizing they've absorbed them. I mean, you, have to, you, you both have to give people the opportunity to say, I'm a more risk averse person. But I think by letting people know, you know, Women are more risk averse. You know, if you're a mentor, you're saying, 
women tend to be more risk averse. Are you sure this, this is, you know, what, did you know that? Do you, do you feel that maybe you should take this risk? It's a little bit more talking to them about the evidence and making it a little less personal. But at the end of the day, I don't think you can, if, if that's their decision, it is their decision. It absolutely is their decision. Then what you can do for the kind of careers you're talking about is actually work on uh, why women choose the majors they choose, or why they, um, do they not see um, role models that, if there are not a lot, enough role models out there for them to see, then the risk to them seems higher, so they're less likely to do it. So in a sense, you have to say, um, choose the riskier major, choose the riskier career because you could be a model. And, and you can't expect to see a lot of models out there because there are not yet. But I, I don't know. I, I tend in these kinds of things when I'm talking to young women just to point out that they exist. And um, so I've talked to women who actually said, uh, a woman recently was talking about how she felt she was not being paid appropriately at a venture capital firm. And I said, well, have you gone in and talked to them about it? Well, no, I don't feel comfortable doing it. And then I say, you, you actually have to do it. You, you have to do it because you're just confirming the notion that if you, of the unwillingness to negotiate actually will affect how you're paid over time. That's just the way it is. That's, those are the norms. Until the companies themselves say, I understand that there is this difference, therefore I'm going to go out and actually not I'm going to evaluate men and women in such a way that negotiating differences don't affect outcomes. That would be the company's solution to that. Uh, for the individual solution to that, it's got to be to recognize that these differences exist and that it's worth going in. Because if you go in, see, I think you can go in and say, and by the way, I'm here and the CEO of Microsoft said something and it's actually not true. Women in general are not being recognized for their performance, and I think I want to bring it to your attention. You can actually bring a whole bunch of this evidence into the room with you. Uh, so, but I, look, I, I, I don't uh, have a solution because um, women do, uh, women, even though it may be the case that a lot of the women you're dealing with are women who, um, have been affected by these cultural norms and might, if they could sort of break out of them, behave differently. They, they have been affected. I, so I don't know how to change that. I don't know how to change that. Throughout this whole talk, I've been thinking how grateful I was that you were my mentor my first year here on the faculty UC Berkeley in teaching. Yeah. So, so thank you. <laughs> um, thank you. We I, was, did, I was very happy <laughs> to do it. We did a, a study between, I think, 11 universities that looked at STEM disciplines STEM. and their percentage uh, within both academe and in industry. And mm -hmm. partly there were some people from the European Union there. Okay. And it was interesting looking at your statistics about these are jobs, these are disciplines where there's higher income earning mm -hmm. and so the higher empowerment. But we did find that in a an interesting reversal than the pattern that you were showing that in, in many of the Scandinavian company, countries um, and Switzerland, mm -hmm. the percentage of women actually in engineering or STEM disciplines is relatively low, mm -hmm. and Turkey was the highest. Oh, that's interesting. That's so, interesting. you know, the, yeah. did you yeah. ever disaggregate um, by discipline in, in any of those studies? Because I. So I, was, so I was using a whole bunch of different studies which sort of come to the kind of conclusions that I was suggesting to you. It, it, I, I said at the beginning, these are not, none of these are my exact area of expertise. I do know that number that I gave you about majors, that was a US number. That was a kind of choice of majors in the US. I'm, I certainly think that as, as much as possible, the important thing to do here is cross country comparisons. I mean, that's one of the reasons I recommend highly this uh, report that Credit Suisse did recently, because they looked at the, the pipelines of uh, women to top management positions and board positions across a wide variety of countries. And you see that narrowing pipeline every place. So you actually do have a lot of countries now. You can see that parity at the beginning is, is, is largely achieved but it really dis dissipates 
significantly, and then the question is what's common to uh, the companies or the, or, the, or the countries that explains this common phenomenon. But um, I'm not, it would be, what would be interesting to me to think about in the Scandinavian cases is do women, um, because of the cultural norms there, are, the pay differentials between these uh, careers may not be nearly as dramatic as they are in the United States. So, to, so it made so the, the the very big differences in pay that result from STEM versus non-STEM in the U.S. may be much that may be much more extreme than it is in Scandinavia. After all, we know in Scandinavia that teachers are paid much better than they're paid here. So, just as a start, you'd expect the differential not to be that large. They would talk about, particularly in Denmark, the cultural differences, whereas the women from Turkey and Algeria said it wasn't gendered. Engineering wasn't considered to be gendered. Wasn't So yes, how do you explain that, the, it, that computer science became so gendered in the United States? I don't understand that myself. So I, I don't have a, you, you need to tell us that. <laughs> but, but it's a very important. Look, one of the things that's absolutely true is that um, if you look Another thing about the Credit Suisse study. So they looked at breakdowns by, by sector as well as by country. And of course, um, certain sectors have much less gender disparity in outcome in companies than other sectors. So mining and manufacturing are going to have the biggest disparities. Uh, recreation and, and health are going to have smaller disparities. You still see the disparities, but they're much smaller. So um, part of this is also sectoral. So there's a lot of, what, what I try to do in the talk is sort of say that there, there are common things, there are enough common things across companies and across countries that there is a gender issue wherever you look. It manifests itself differently, but there is a, there are gender issues both in politics and in economic participation. That's what I would say. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Michael Steger. Uh, I work in global economics with the Schiller Institute. Okay. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate your speaking tonight. And my question, I came actually to hear what you think, what I think is probably the most important question on the planet today. So, and I wanted your input. And so the, I just want one freedom to make one point of context before sure. I can make the question. So um, Chancellor Merkel and President Hollande recently made a trip to Moscow and then again to Minsk. Right. And there is discussion, there was a presentation by a former ambassador to Russia, Jack Matlock, recently, mm -hmm. the National Press Club, that we are closer to nuclear war today than we were even in the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis. Mm -hmm. So the world is at a grave danger. Many Americans, many people in the world are very unaware of such things, but clearly the events and the steps taken by Merkel and Hollande indicate such a situation. Now the other side of it, and this is the economic question, is Greece and what Greece indicates, because it's a very big question. And Greece has an option, where well, I'm not sure the European Union does. Mm -hmm. There are nations now known as the BRICS, Russia, China, India, Brazil, South Africa, nations like Egypt or Argentina, which are joining them right. with incredible economic growth commitments, right. engineering, science, food production, right. yeah. just remarkable process. Mm -hmm. Should the, uh, so I'd like to know, we have an initiative for the United States to join in that process, the BRICS. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to know if you would support something like that and what you generally think in this political context of this, this economic question which does seem to be a bit of an east-west or a, just a divide of two systems in the world so, today. So I'm not sure. I don't, I don't think the question is relevant, but I'm not sure I, to this talk. But I have thought a lot of, I mean, if, if you're talking about BRICS, like the, the, the BRICS, the Brazil, Russia, is that, the, is that what you mean by BRICS? So the, the truth is, and, and this is a, a, it is relevant to this talk in one respect, there is an inexorable and significant shift in the weight of the global economy away from the developed countries towards the BRICS, towards the emerging market economies. The two major economies that drive global growth today are the US and China. China is growing, even with a significant slowdown, twice as fast as the US. China does actually quite a good job, and it would be interesting to hear Esther and Harvey talk about this, on. Uh, 
on gender issues, on mobilizing um, uh, their talented uh, female workforce and uh, on um, educating their female workforce. But there, there clearly is this shift going on in the world economy um, and different different society, so what I was trying to say by this is that you can see that across societies at different levels of development, even ones that have been committed to gender parity for a very long time and have it deeply embedded in their cultural norms and deeply embedded in their political institutions, have a ways to go, and those would be the Nordic countries. A very interesting thing going on right now is Japan is basically studying and as much as possible what's going on in the Nordic countries and trying to do exactly the same thing. I mean, it's really quite interesting. They've adopted the Nordic countries as their example. Um, the, but the, the emerging market countries, I mean, so here's, here's it. When we s listed all the countries by gender gap, um, certain com countries came forward to the World Economic Forum and said, we would like to set up a task force with business leaders in our society to improve our performance on the gender parity measures. So what were these countries? One was Turkey, one was Korea, one is India, uh, and um, one is Mexico. So these are countries that just came forward and said, you know, we really think we could do better. We see the case here. We see that there is economic benefit to this. We see that we have t very talented women that we're not mobilizing enough. Let us work on this together. So I, I think, let's say emerging markets are becoming more and more important, and a number of the big ones now are focused on this issue. And that's how I will relate to uh, the question, because it's hard for me to draw another link. Okay. Professor Tyson. Yes. As a former student, last time we met, I was finishing my PhD uh, at UCLA and also worked uh, since uh, on development issues. I've actually seen a very clear connection with your presentation today, which is really talking about how social constructs manifest themselves in sort of economic processes. Mm -hmm whether it's at the micro level of the firm or just individual decisions. But what's really interesting is that as the economy is also shaping and transforming the way that industries form, and these countries are competing to absorb the highest levels of productivity, right. they're also trying to adopt and reform and transform the social constructs that define productivity. Okay, so, I think that's very important. Mm -hmm. So by breaking down these types of studies, we're actually able to see how these social constructs perpetuate inequality, perpetuate mm -hmm. unproductivity. Right. And so from one perspective, I'm going to be building off of the work that you've just laid out um, and work that I'm doing in the Middle East and Dubai. Great and really looking at how we can use this as examples to look at other groups that aren't participating, specifically people with disabilities. I myself have mm -hmm. a severe disability, mm -hmm. but have benefited from mm -hmm. policies and opportunities to change that construct. Yes. So I wanted to commend you for helping us think about how clearly the way we behave and the way we treat each other and the way the policies kind of define our social roles could actually unlock tremendous potential. And only by doing the type of research that you are sharing today can we really unlock those keys. Thank you very much. Thank you, that's, that's really important. It's very important research, it's very important research. And I really do wanna emphasize that I think a lot of the findings, so this was a, a talk focused on gender, but diversity is really the issue. And a lot of the studies are looking at diversity broadly measured. And um, there's a fascinating study that actually will be coming out as a case at Haas based on a very large company sample. And the very large company sample is demonstrating that the diversity of the team, these are team engagements, really does affect both the profitability of the engagement and also the quality of the engagement. So better decisions 
more profitable outcomes. Diversity really does matter. And our social, so understanding this, the cultural norms, because th that, the reason I like that, that table at the end so much is because we need to be aware of the social constructs we're carrying around. And, and we need to, therefore, once we know them, we can, you know, maybe mentor a woman to be a little more, take a little more risk, or we can uh, encourage a CEO, no, no, you, you actually do have to have a process whereby you're transparent in how you evaluate people. You can't have this sort of difference in, in negotiating style affecting merit, mer what you think are meritocratic outcomes, but they're not meritocratic outcomes. They're something else. So I think this is uh, very important. And I, I do think, uh, so large, very large global companies um, are playing a very interesting role here because um, they, because their markets are all over the place and they're hiring talent all over the place and they're selling all over the place. So in many contexts, all of those countries that I mentioned that are in the task force, that is being driven by their global companies or by global companies who are operating in their countries because they can see the business case for themselves so clearly. And they're, so in, in a way, once you can see the case or feel the case, you can become a, a real leader here. But great research. I, I look forward to it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So to conclude, um, it's my pleasure to invite Esther and Harvey up to the stage um, to personally thank Laura for such an inspiring lecture. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you guys. It's thank so much you. fun to be with my students. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's really lovely. Oh, thank yeah. you. Oh, thank you so much. Great. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you. Where are they? Mm -hmm. Great. Thank, thank you so you. much. You guys are great. So nice of you to do this for the university. Thank you.